Hey all, Scott here. It's been four years since I felt joy. The Nintendo Switch has worn me out so much during each and every one of its birth months. I can't look at a game called Snipper Clips the same ever again. I'm ruined. Why is the Nintendo Switch not exciting me anymore? Why is the way I am the way I am? Why does this have a bitter aftertaste? Oh, that explains two things. The Nintendo Switch is officially negative one year away from turning three. Four whole years of a device that can play Flip Wars. Let's celebrate! It's tradition for me. Every year around this time, I bitch. I have officially talked about my experiences with the Nintendo Switch annually for well over three days. So let's discuss everything Nintendo Switch related that occurred from March 2020 to February 2021. And when I say everything, I don't mean it. This is primarily based on what I played, what I experienced, everything through my eyes, so you know what that means. Whining. All right, let's start talking Nintendo Switch March 2020 to February 2021. Which month are we starting on? Well, I'll be damned. March was a month of pure chaos. I mean, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon and Luigi's Mansion 3 DLC. I only have two hands. Of course, the only thing that mattered was the release of Animal Crossing New Horizons on March 20th. After 100 hours, I got bored. F*** this game. No, I think New Horizons is great. I just think when I fell off of it, I really fell off of it. I played nearly every day for two months. I stopped playing for one day, then my eye twitched whenever I thought about playing again. See, the game starts off wonderfully. You take part in Tom Nook's getaway package and get to live on a remote island that starts out looking f***ing disgusting. But you start prettying it up. Pick where your neighbors go, upgrade and pay off your digs by making money through various means, finding it in rocks, selling rocks, every day is an adventure. Animal Crossing is a game about life and collecting. You're supposed to take the game at your own pace and do whatever you want, but just like life, you have lots of limitations, but I think those limitations are what makes Animal Crossing so unique. If you could legitimately do whatever you want in this game, it would just be The Sims. In Animal Crossing, you need those little annoyances, those neighbors you don't like, the fact it takes so long to pay off your house, how you have to talk to characters to get anywhere. Yeah, this isn't great, but it's Animal Crossing. They want to bring you to their world, not show you a debug menu when you want to travel to a different island. It takes time to make your island the island you want it to be, and in my opinion, that makes Animal Crossing Animal Crossing. Collecting fish and bugs and fossils is a lot of fun, donating them to the museum and seeing everything fill out, making friends with digital goats. It's hard to describe Animal Crossing and make it sound fun because it's not. But I think the idea of collecting all these different items and constantly working towards something makes it a rewarding and addictive experience. This is my town. I built it this way and it's just as optimistically pathetic as I always wanted it to be. Now, this is all nothing new when it comes to Animal Crossing. This is par for the course. New Horizons is set up slightly differently it's more focused on grinding. You need to take this island and build it up to what you want it to be rather than showing up to a town that already exists and settling down there like in previous entries. You have to really make the most out of your surroundings and constantly pick up supplies and materials to craft items, which is a new mechanic. You have all these DIY recipes you can collect, which then tells you the quantity of what materials you need to craft new items. It's kind of a cute idea, but the way it's implemented more so annoys me now. Whenever a character would give me a special thing and it turned out to be a DIY recipe, that's... Dung. I think I'd rather have all the recipes available to me from the get-go rather than having to unlock most of them. What's the fun in getting a recipe card? Aw, oh, thanks for this pile of work you just gave me to do. Now I have to find all the materials needed for the item if I want it. Crafting's a fine idea as it gives a huge purpose to nearly every minor little thing you pick up in the game. I just feel like it's implemented in a way that almost makes me resent it. Because on top of that, your tools, axe, net, fishing pole, these can all break after a certain amount of time due to the crafting mechanic. They want you to keep crafting stuff, so let's force you to constantly craft new equipment due to your equipment breaking all the time. This is just annoying. It's not like in Breath of the Wild when your weapons break. That makes sense. It's to force you to improvise and constantly try new weapons. Here, it's just a waste of my time to get me to use some new gimmick, which I honestly barely use. If my axe breaks, I'm just gonna go whatever. I'd rather go to the store and buy a new one rather than gather materials to craft one for free. There's a Nook Miles program at play here, which gives you points you can exchange for certain items by doing whatever. If you collect a certain amount of fruit or sell a certain amount of items, you get Nook Miles, and I love this addition. It gives purpose and incentive to the smallest things you do, which Animal Crossing involves a lot of smallest things. The world does run dry after a while, though. Nook Miles are a lot more fun at the start of the game as you're constantly making progress, and it's super satisfying. As time goes on, though, you unlock less and less. Now, they've been updating this game a ton since it launched. New content, new items, new things to do. 
But oh my god, Nintendo, stop doing this. Come on, Nintendo, just do what the 23-year-old white boy said. I'm not a fan of how Nintendo will launch a game with minimal content just to end up releasing free updates to reach the quota of what's acceptable. Mario Tennis Aces, Kirby Star Allies, ARMS, Splatoon 1, and Splatoon 2. All these games released with, honestly, not enough content. So they basically hide the fact they're finishing the game by saying, you're getting free updates. Holy sh**, that's a steal, I'll buy nine copies. New Horizons launched with a fair amount of content, but so much was missing. You compare New Horizons to New Leaf on the 3DS, and it's crazy how much stuff New Leaf had in comparison at launch. And then they acted like adding deep sea diving and the ability to visit others' islands via the Dream Suite to the game in July was like, wow, we're really putting the cherry on the top of this complete Sunday. First off, no. These are features that were there since day one in New Leaf, and pretty much all of these updates Nintendo is doing to New Horizons is adding back stuff that's been in Animal Crossing before. No new stuff. Secondly, I fell off of New Horizons in early June, and it's really hard to go back, especially with the updates. You'd think the updates would incentivize me, but no. Honestly, I'm terrified of opening this game. They've added so much I'm worried about missing something they added or being overwhelmed with how much they added. But my main problem with these free update games when I'm done with a game, it's really hard to pull me back in. Cool, Mario Tennis Ace has got new characters. It's a shame I stopped playing. You turned me off by not having this stuff at launch, but by the time it shows up in the game, I don't care anymore, I'm sorry. By June, I would open up Animal Crossing, Isabel would give me the news for the day, and pretty much every day she'd say, oh, looks like nothing's really going on. I started seeing a lot of repeated stuff, hearing the same things over and over again from my villagers. Nothing new was happening. It was time to call it quits. After 100 plus hours, I got my fill. I know I just complained a ton about this game, but I obviously enjoyed it. I just wish I could keep enjoying it, but all those things kind of added up to why I stopped playing. But I really liked New Horizons, so don't take my criticisms as it's a mediocre or bad game or something. No, it's a good one. It's just when you really care about something, you want to see it be the best it can be. Plus, I think Animal Crossing fans all hate Animal Crossing to some extent. Had a great time with New Horizons, don't care for how they're doing updates, holy f this game is pretty. You know, a week before New Horizons launched, a special edition Animal Crossing Nintendo Switch released. Thank God it didn't come with the game, that would be a deal. The other physical release Nintendo had this month was Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team DX. What do you think I think? I'm a simple man, if I see a Pokemon, I'm going to squint. This is a remake of the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS game, the first entry in the series. I don't see anybody outside of existing fans really getting much out of this. The art style's cute, I just can't get into this gameplay. They modernized this game, and at the same time, they really didn't. This is a $60 2020 release. I ordered it on Amazon, and they sent me a European copy. Do I look French? No, f you, I'm Polish. Can't forget about the Luigi's Mansion 3 DLC, because the census sure did. This was such an odd release, like, who asked for this? Costumes for the online multiplayer, and new multiplayer minigames to play cool. But it's like, everybody who bought Luigi's Mansion 3 bought it for the single player. Why not try to add a story expansion or something? Just an odd thing to release as paid DLC. Outside of that, Doom 64 released, but nobody noticed. Luigi's Mansion 3 got DLC. It was supposed to be a pre-order bonus you got with Doom Eternal, but since the Nintendo Switch release got delayed, while the other platforms got both games at once, Switch owners just got Doom 64 on launch day. Yeah, it's alright though, it launched on the same day as New Horizons, I had enough on my plate. It was only five bones, and was a pretty solid re-release of the Nintendo 64 original. I like that these companies are really digging deep into their archives to re-release random little oddities. Like, did anybody really look at the Nintendo Switch in 2017 and say, can't wait till Doom 64 on it. Cooking Mama Cookstar released at the end of the month just to be taken off the eShop immediately for not having the rights to use the Cooking Mama brand. You need rights? So many rumors floated around about this one, how it mines Bitcoin, steals your credit card info, could ruin your Switch. Of course, I had to buy one. None of them were true, but they definitely added to the physical copies of this game being expensive for a second there, and the worst part about it is it isn't that good. And it's exactly what I expected it to be, a motion-controlled cooking arcade game like most of the other Cooking Mamas. It's not great, but I don't think it's nearly as bad as others have said. As a and I'm brave enough to stick up for Cooking Mama Cookstar. They should draft me. Even though this month has already been pretty busy in terms of new releases, it was oddly quiet on the news front, and it has been for the year up until this point. I mean, there hadn't been a full-blown Nintendo Direct since September of 2019, and we really didn't know what Nintendo's lineup looked like after Animal Crossing. Well, thank God that all changed on March 26th with a... Nintendo Direct Mini. Oh, it looks like we have a hearty dose of real world issues affecting pretty much everybody's ability to work starting in March of 2020. So many people had to start working remotely from home that it definitely affected plans for the year. I just went outside and realized that. Oh my God. Because of such a thing, I think it's fair to lower expectations just a bit as so many things prevented this year from being everything these game companies wanted it to be. Of course, a lot of issues reared their heads in 2020, so I will be referring to all of them each instance they get brought up. 
First up is Jaundice. Because of Jaundice, Nintendo had to settle for putting together a Nintendo Direct Mini in March, but I still found their silence on games after Animal Crossing puzzling. Many pointed out that because of the lupus, they weren't able to discuss new games, but they've been pretty quiet since September when that wasn't a worldwide issue. I also don't really care for their info delivery style of we're only focusing on Animal Crossing until Animal Crossing is out because Let's be honest, Animal Crossing is mega popular, but it isn't everybody's cup of tea. Would it have really killed them to at least give Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition a release date beforehand just to give fans of other things something to chew on? Instead, Nintendo was only talking about Animal Crossing, whether you were an Animal Crossing fan or not. I'm not gonna act like it didn't work, it just made things a bit less interesting as a fan. Well, this Nintendo Direct Mini was uploaded just under a week after New Horizons release, and detailed Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition coming on May 29th, XCOM 2, Bioshock, and Borderlands collections coming on that same day, Shin Sakai Into the Depths by Capcom releasing right alongside the Direct, which was an iPhone game beforehand. Cool. I understand mobile games can be hugely detailed and legitimate experiences, but if it used to be a mobile game and it's coming to Switch, that does knock it down a few pegs for me. A Nintendo published game released after the Direct, though. Good job. I really like the amount of smaller eShop games Nintendo would release for the Nintendo 3DS, and I wish to see more of that kind of junk come to the Nintendo Switch. We got Snipper Clips, which was wonderful, but after that, well, Flip Wars? The Stretchers? Name four people who cared. Good Job is an interesting physics-based puzzle game where you have jobs to do and you have to manipulate the environment to get them done. It's really cute and pretty fun. I think it was very quickly forgotten about though, and honestly, I kind of get it. I don't know why, but this game feels super similar to countless other games. It's co-op, so it kind of feels like a lot of other wacky couch co-op games like Moving Out or Overcooked. It's 100% its own thing, but it kind of blends in a bit. Catherine Full Body got announced by Atlas after everybody asked them to bring over Persona 5. Ring Fit Adventure got an update, adding a rhythm game mode, the next Smash Smash Brothers Fighter was announced to be announced. A fighter from ARMS! Okay, we'll find out who it is in June. Oh, I'll be damned. You saved us all from immediate disappointment. I was super okay with an ARMS character being announced. I love the character designs, and as much as third-party characters are fun, having DLC be so third-party centric somewhat devalues it when a new third-party character makes it in. The more Nintendo characters to balance it out was a bit necessary. Uh, Bravely Default 2 got a demo. Yes! Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics! Ninjala was shown off. Uh, this was a Splatoon-esque game that originally looked intriguing to me and still did, though the fact it was revealed to be a free-to-play game kind of killed a lot of my interest. Uh, it just kind of told me this wasn't the game I would have wanted it to be. Panzer Dragoon Remake got released right after the Direct. Uh, Jesus, they pushed a ton of games out after this. If anything needs to be re-released or remade, it's Sega Saturn game, so I was interested in this one and could have been better. It just lacks a certain amount of polish. They obviously rushed this to meet the deadline of being in this Nintendo Direct. Uh, so many features were added in later as an update. It's still Panzer Dragoon, it just could have been a bit better. Like, why is this aiming reticle in front of the dragon? There were a few more announcements showed in a sizzle reel, like Burnout Paradise Remastered, I was ecstatic to see that, and also Mr. Drill and Land coming back, uh, ending things off with a look at the Pokemon Sword and Shield expansion pass. I think we already knew pretty much everything they talked about here. I personally didn't mind this Direct Mini. I got Clubhouse games, that's all that matters. In addition to this, an Indie World presentation occurred on March 17th, detailing games like Exit the Gungeon and Baldo. Uh, nothing earth shattering though. Lego Mario sets were announced, but first teased with this video, and many people assumed this screen was a Nintendo Switch and Lego Mario was going to be a Switch dock. I have no idea why people thought that. I know the Switch's screen is slightly lower resolution, but it's not this bad. But right at the end of March, a rumor that loads of Mario remasters and a New Paper Mario were coming. The rumor initially stated how pretty much Mario's entire back catalog of games were coming. His entire back catalog. In reality, this just meant most of the 3D games were getting remasters, and that got my mind racing. Could this mean that Mario 64 will get a fully orchestrated soundtrack and Mario Odyssey level visuals and Sunshine gets reworked and they fix up all of its little issues and Galaxy and Galaxy 2 get retooled to be perfectly playable with just button controls but also feature motion as an option as well? And maybe Mario 3D Land gets prettied up and has changes to accommodate the lack of 3D and 64DS gets full analog control for the first time! It was a fun five months before none of that happened. A new Paper Mario though, apparently it was going back to the series RPG roots. Yeah, and I'm not sitting. Well, after such a busy start to the year, Arc System Works decided to release as many eShop games that were already available on Switch as possible. That'll give us something to talk about. I don't know, they just decided to put out $5 versions of Double Dragon 1, 2, 3, Super Dodgeball, and River City Ransom on the NES separately when most of these games were already on NES Online or a part of the Double Dragon compilation that released in February. God, I've been wanting to play Double Dragon on my Nintendo Switch. Separately. SEPARATELY! Square Enix put out Trials of Mana, which was a full 3D remake of Second Densetsu 3, the sequel to Secret of Mana. That game never came out here. 
until last summer when it was fully localized as Trials of Mana in the Collection of Mana compilation. Alright, super cool we got both a full localization of the original Super Famicom game and a full modern remake of the thing. But getting both kind of devalues each one in my opinion though. Like yeah, the remake is really neat, but we just got the original so it's like cool but not nearly as groundbreaking as it could have been I guess. But that's more so because Square Enix did the best possible thing and released both titles. But yeah, I'm happy to see Square do more stuff like this. While other companies are damn near petrified at the thought of remaking a Japanese only game in a relatively dormant franchise, they're willing to put this kind of stuff into production. Because of that, I played the demo and then moved on to Picross S4. Come on, I had to. It's a fourth Picross game. Indivisible finally released on the platform and it was about time. I mean, this game came out for PS4, Xbox One, and PC in October 2019 and took this long to release on Switch? Even the developers were surprised. Streets of Rage 4, made by the same guys who did the Wonder Boy Dragon's Trap remake. These people are so good at Sega reboots with hand-drawn art styles. Everybody has their niche. So Sega's been doing a fair amount of licensing recently, letting some developers remake some of their games or create sequels to them without a ton of their involvement. Like they didn't develop or publish Wonder Boy the Dragon's Trap, the Panzer Dragoon remake, Shenmue 3, or this. I really like that Sega's willing to let others continue their franchises for them, but it is a bit depressing they aren't willing to do it themselves. But it barely matters because Streets of Rage 4 is amazing! It looks and sounds so good and the gameplay is so satisfying and fun, honestly, a fantastic modern beat-em-up in every way. I think both Streets of Rage fans and newcomers to the series will have a blast with this. And honestly, that was about it for games released in April. It was a bit of a light month if you weren't playing Double Dragon 2. But news-wise, Mario Maker 2 received its final update! Can it really be called the final one when you've only done two? A ton of power-ups, items, and the ability to create your own world maps. This was an insane addition to the game. It's a shame I haven't tried it yet. I don't know, much like Animal Crossing, I definitely fell off of Mario Maker 2, but that shouldn't take away from the fact this update was amazing. The fact that Super Mario Bros. 2 was incorporated so much within power-ups and items tells me that potentially they were working on a full Mario 2 game style, but because of Mario Maker 2's lower sales, they just pushed it all out via this final update. Oh, lower sales. Six million ain't nothing to sneeze at, but considering this is an endless Mario game that has infinite possibilities and is tailor-made to go viral, that number is definitely lower than you'd expect. When twice as many people are willing to spend 60 on pneumonia, there's something wrong here. I feel like to most people, the idea of this being an endless Mario game doesn't really cross their mind. And when you look at this next to New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe, this looks like a 2D Mario game. This looks like I have to make the 2D Mario game myself. It's not immediately obvious this has an entire 2D Mario game in here via the story mode and you can play all these different levels. And to be fair, even if you did know all of that, uh, sometimes a traditional 2D Mario game is just a bit more appealing. You really have to dig for the good levels in Mario Maker. Platoon 2 came back from the dead as Nintendo announced that in May, they would be doing another Splatfest after they stopped doing them last year. They probably decided that due to the eczema going around with so many stuck in doors, why not hold another Splatfest? Crisis was revealed for the Switch. You know, this was the premier PC game back in 2007. If your computer could run this thing, you were tough shit. My Nintendo Switch can barely run a WWE game, but now Crisis is coming to it. Let's revolt. The Nintendo Switch's firmware was updated to include button mapping. You can basically make whatever button registers whatever you want. You can make A, B, and B up for all I care. This is actually quite a fantastic fantastic feature, and it's system-wide, which means it'll work across all games. You can do something as simple as swap the L button with the ZL button, or go hog wild and make a game completely playable via one controller. It's such a cool feature. But in the annals of this Nintendo Switch update lied code that hinted at the future announcement of a new Nintendo Switch model, a Nintendo Switch Pro, if you will. Yeah, Nintendo Switch Pro has been a pretty consistent topic, almost as consistent as topics itself. I just see all these people say that because new consoles are coming out, that the Nintendo Switch isn't gonna be able to keep up with them. You know, it won't get any ports from the PlayStation 5, third-party support will dry up, all right, Poindexter, what am I thinking right now? Damn it. Listen, I would buy a Nintendo Switch Pro in a heartbeat. You really think after I bought a card binder for Mario Sports Superstars Amiibo cards, a Switch Pro would be where I draw the line? I think Nintendo could greatly benefit from having a Switch with slightly more horsepower, one that would primarily just increase potential frame rates and resolutions in games rather than having Switch Pro exclusive games or whatever. I mean, we're seeing issues with Nintendo developed games. When those have small frame rate hiccups and can't reach 1080p, I think an upgrade is definitely welcomed. But the idea that we need a Pro because of the new consoles like the PlayStation 5 so the Nintendo Nintendo can keep getting modern ports. Honey, please. 99% of third-party support on the Nintendo Switch are asshole games or games that are graphically simple enough to run. Sure, we got Doom, Wolfenstein 2, The Witcher 3, but those are few and far between. The Switch isn't selling because of those games. Those are bonuses. The people buying Nintendo Switches are buying them for Animal Crossing, Smash Brothers, Mario, Zelda, Pokemon. A Switch Pro isn't necessary, but I wouldn't mind one at all and think it's gonna happen. Just Stop acting like third-party support is in trouble on the Switch because of a new generation of consoles. Oh no, the PlayStation 5 is coming out. We aren't going to get such Nintendo Switch games as... 
Doom 64. What else happened? Uh, oh, Nintendo Network IDs were compromised. Some hackers got a hold of them, but not all Nintendo Switch users have Nintendo Network IDs. If you created a Nintendo Network ID on Wii U and then used that to log into your Nintendo Switch, then you should be worried. May 2020 was the month Scott didn't play Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. A remaster of the original Xenoblade Chronicles from the Wii, which was later ported to the new Nintendo 3DS, but this version doesn't include the sound test, amiibo support, and 3D model viewer of that version, so thanks for calling it definitive. I needed that. It's great the original Xenoblade is now on a platform people give a shit about it on. It released too late here in North America on the Wii for most to pay attention to it, and it was only available on specific 3DS models, so to have it on the Nintendo Switch with multiple improvements and an HD is definitely a good thing. Though this version is still a bit lacking in various ways. For being a Wii game at its core, Definitive Edition has a pretty low resolution going from 720p to 504p. I didn't even know that was a resolution. It's even worse in handheld mode. And not to say this isn't a good game and you shouldn't pick it up, but don't take my word for it, I have no idea what I'm talking about with a game like this. How about a game I know slightly more about, The Wonderful 101 Remastered. So, first up, this game was originally on the Wii U, published by Nintendo. What do you think happened? This game definitely deserved a second chance on the Switch, but I think it deserved it in a different way. So the developers of the game Platinum created this port for the Switch and asked Nintendo if they would be interested in publishing it. They said yeah, but it would stay exclusive to Nintendo platforms, so Platinum decided to publish it themselves. What did they think would happen? Why even ask Nintendo to publish it if no matter what you were trying to bring it to other platforms? So Platinum started a Kickstarter to fund the remaster. The remaster they already completed and this Kickstarter money was mainly just to publish the game slash get pre-orders for it. It's fine, it's just a little iffy to me. You start a Kickstarter when you really don't need to. Like I think crowdfunding is great for artists creating something they couldn't do otherwise. Nintendo offered to publish this game for Platinum, but they thought, no, our fans can fund this for us. And on top of all that, when the game came out, I didn't like this version. I think the Wii U release is far better, and honestly, I really would have preferred if Nintendo published the Switch version, because if they did, I'm sure they would have forced Platinum to do a better job reworking the game for one screen. Wonderful 101 used both screens on Wii U. It was built around them. It's not like it couldn't work on one screen, but the dual screen use was baked into the game at its core. It would have taken a bit more work to redesign it here and there. So they clunkily added a sub-screen that is annoying and looks gross, and it's even there when you're buying upgrades. Like, you couldn't have reworked the shop to not require a second screen? This is when Wii U ports are at their worst, in my opinion. When it's painfully obvious this was made for a different console than what you're playing it on. Captain Toad has a blinking blue orb on screen at all times to use as a pointer to click certain objects he would have touched on the Wii U gamepad. Yeah, the way it was always meant to be. Also, calling this remastered is like calling a stick a tree. This is the same as the Wii U version but worse. The dual screen setup is clunky. You have multiple options for it, but it's still less than ideal. They didn't really go in and change problematic elements from the original, like the fact that tutorial isn't great. This is the same game, and I feel these features would have been fixed if Nintendo was publishing the game, but Platinum crowdfunded the release themselves to ensure they could release it on PC and PS4, so the game could be enjoyed by as many people as possible. Firstly, it would have been even more enjoyed if they put more care into this port. Secondly, nobody talked about this game being on PC and PS4. I'm sorry, but most of the people who were interested in this game were Nintendo fans. I don't think this game made a big enough splash on the other platforms to warrant this. Wonderful 101 is a great action game. It's adrenaline pumping, super fun once you get a hold of it. I just think the Wii U version is better. If you only have the newer consoles, it's not ideal, but it's still the wonderful 101. Bioshock The Collection, Borderlands Legendary Collection, and XCOM 2 Collection all launched on the same day as Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. I only bought the Bioshock games, and buying them gives you all three on your home screen. It was so nice to have these games on a Nintendo platform for the first time. They're such a welcome addition to the Switch's lineup, and it was so cool seeing them playable on a portable. Uh, Borderlands 2 was on the Vita, but I think that's considered more sleep paralysis than actual game. Shantae and the Seven Sirens, forgot that even came out. They released this on iOS first because Apple paid them off to be a part of their whole Apple Arcade shtick and I think that really hurt the talk around this game. It's like, oh, it's finally out. Again. The Elder Scrolls Blades is a mobile game that Bethesda was acting like it was a big deal it was coming to the Switch. I don't care. Bug Fables was an indie game taking heavy inspiration from the first two Paper Mario games. And if modern Paper Mario doesn't do it for you, maybe give this one a try because you sure as hell aren't getting what you want from Nintendo. So out of nowhere, Nintendo decided to announce Paper Mario the Origami King one morning on Twitter. Oh, this has some credibility to the rumors from March. We're getting a new Paper Mario game featuring 
Oh my god. A more epic narrative? Characters with actual character? What is this? Paper Mario is back because I feel the need to eat up anything Nintendo releases for the Switch because I can't think for myself. See, Paper Mario has been in a weird place ever since the third entry. The first two games were typical RPGs with a Mario spin. Super Paper Mario was more of a platformer. Sticker Star was back to more traditional Paper Mario gameplay, but with an incredibly poorly thought out gameplay mechanic of using stickers to battle. Topped off with the fact they removed any interesting characters and settings and replaced them with generic toads and typical new Super Mario Brothers locations and copy and paste the same issues over to Color Splash, but dial them down a notch. I kind of like Color Splash, but the Origami King was looking to be somewhat different. What the hell is this? Well, I did enjoy my time with Color Splash. It is not perfect, but I thought it was decent enough to see through to the end. This game was already garnering a ton more interest than Color Splash or Sticker Star ever did, so I think regardless, this was a step in the right direction. But also, the fact Nintendo just announced this game randomly on Twitter, terrifying. I live in fear now. Nintendo also updated the NES and SNES online apps with YES! RIGAR! Panel Day Pawn on Switch featuring online multiplayer via the SNES app. This is all I ever wanted! Tetris Attack is one of my favorite Super Nintendo games, but this is the localized version of Panel Day Pawn in Japan. Instead of Yoshi's, we get small fairies. It's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. I do prefer the Yoshi's, but this is still Tetris Attack gameplay. It's one of the most satisfying and addictive puzzle games out there. They couldn't do standard Tetris Attack due to the Tetris license. I'll take the fairies, damn it. Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics is phenomenal. If you're not in the 30 hours plus club, get the f*** out of my face. Oh, look who came crawling back to the casuals. Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics is a sequel to Clubhouse Games on the Nintendo DS, but it doesn't really feel like much of a continuation of that game, rather an excuse to put a more casual minigame collection on Switch. Something for that Wii Sports Wii Play audience with many of the card and board games included via the original Clubhouse Games. This one is developed by ND Cube, the developers of Modern Mario Parties. <laughs> yep, that's vomit. However, they seem to do a tolerable job with games of the not Mario Party variety, and a new example of that is Clubhouse Games. How can anybody say Nintendo's release schedule was light this year? They released 51 games on one day. It's just so nice to have relaxing and simple pick-up-and-play games like these on the Switch that never get old. I may not always be up for a game of Luigi's Mansion 3, but I'll never get tired of Hair and Hounds. Where's the sequel? I really liked Moncala, Dots and Boxes, Four in a Row, Hit and Blow, Hex, Hair and Hounds, Gomoku, Chinese Checkers, Last Card. It's just Uno, and I'm a big fan of electronic Uno. E Uno, if you will. Matching's great, Pigtail's fun, golf, billiards, bowling, darts, air hockey, shooting gallery. I like a lot of the games here, and they're the full fledged things. These are mostly card and board games. They're gonna be just as fun 10 years from now as they are today. And Nintendo decided to put in online multiplayer for nearly all of them between both strangers and friends. This is what I'm talking about! It also looks really good. The visuals are quite nice. The sound design is good too. The sound effects of the game pieces or cards sound so satisfying, and the music is generally very relaxing and peaceful. Of course, there are some drawbacks. I think everybody got really excited when they saw bowling was here, like, oh my god, Wii Sports is back! And they include a tanks game, a shooting gallery, fishing? This is obviously trying to replicate a lot of what Wii Play and Wii Sports did. Unfortunately, I don't think any of the Wii Sports slash Play games Clubhouse Games does is better than how Wii Sports slash Play did them. Like, bowling is fine, but I don't know, the controls are way more bitchy. Like, might just let me fling the controller as hard as I want. Golf is like this tabletop version, and it's still fun, but compared to Wii Sports, this gets old way quicker. Quicker, which is weird considering these are the exact same maps, which were the exact same maps in Golf on NES. Just the fact that it's all miniaturized makes it kind of feel like I'm doing the exact same thing every time I play it. I'm always gonna hit the ball over here and it's always gonna go there. At least with Wii Sports, the camera angle and motion controls made it feel like there were way more possibilities. I really like billiards, but really this is the exact same thing as eight ball pool you can play on your iPhone for free. Also, it's weird to say this, but this is oddly not a great party game. It's really only meant for two players. There are a few three and four player games, but like, why isn't bowling more than two players? Why isn't darts? Why isn't golf? You're just passing off between each player in those games. Why isn't this offered? It's obvious Clubhouse was meant to satiate the desire for the Wii series to come back, but I don't think Nintendo really wanted to do that and would rather push a franchise that doesn't have a dead console's name in its title. They would rather not do that, doesn't mean they won't. So they wanted to do a Wii Play type game again, dug in their archives and realized they made a game called Clubhouse Games, said, that'll do, and made another one. But it's a damn good one. I love this game. It's just simple, casual fun, and I like games like this, damn it. I would still like to see Wii Sports or Wii Sports Resort return someday. They did their own games better and had a lot more personality. But even if they do come back, I still think Clubhouse Games has enough merit to warrant a purchase. And if you think otherwise, all you have to do is play for over 30 hours and I'll believe you. But that wasn't it for Nintendo. Out of nowhere, they released a a free game on the eShop, Jump Rope Challenge. Holy shit. 
it. So yeah, this was a free limited release to be taken off the eShop at a later date, a game that Nintendo employees made in their free time due to working from home because of dermatitis. Yeah, hold the two Joy-Con in both hands and pretend you're jumping rope. It works pretty well and counts even better. Kind of reminds me of Wii Play and WarioWare. Uh, like, remember how in Pose Me the background would change when you would reach different levels? Bam. And just the simple aesthetic does give me WarioWare vibes. It's a cute little freebie and it was popular enough they added a bunch of random costumes for the bunny character and extended its availability on the eShop until further notice. However, the big game I was looking forward to this month was embarrassing. SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated, a remake of one of my favorite childhood games. So I played this guy on the GameCube constantly. It's a pretty good 3D platformer, not unlike Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie. Now one of the greatest games of all time, that's pushing it a bit. I've heard so many people talk endlessly about this game being such an amazing title, and then when those who didn't grow up with it try it out, they're like, it's pretty good. Uh, nothing much more than that though. I think this game stood out to all of us who grew up with it because it was incredibly faithful to a cartoon we all loved. Being a collectathon where you explore all these settings and complete objectives meant we got to be in the world of the show and talk to all these different characters. And on top of that, it was just well made. It had good music. Visually, I always thought it was pretty top notch for a licensed kids game. And that's what I think makes this one stand out so much. It was really good for a licensed kids game. As a standard game, it was good. I just don't think it would wow anybody who A, didn't play it as a kid in 2003, and B, isn't a fan of the source material. But I think everybody can agree, this was a quality game that accomplished everything it set out to do. And just the fact that it was getting a full remake, that's insane! This is like the last game I would have expected to get that kind of treatment, but here it is. <sighs> As I was always pretty skeptical about this remake on the lead up to release, any footage I saw just looked slightly off. Like it looked pretty good, but animations and some designs just didn't look right. SpongeBob's arms were too short. There's always this lack of polish that permeated throughout anything I saw in the game. But regardless, it came out in late June. It was okay. I played and beat it on Xbox One because I wanted an excuse to use the thing. June 23rd was when I remembered I owned another rectangle. But I still bought it on Nintendo Switch because the idea of playing Battle for Bikini Bottom portably was just too amazing. Now the game itself is just fine. I can tell the developers really cared and were quite talented. They just didn't have the same level of appreciation for the game the fans did. Like they knew it was a beloved game and had a ton of respect for it, but weren't like fans who grew up with the game themselves. I feel like they just didn't think some things through. Like why did they change this picture in the bedroom? SpongeBob had a picture with his favorite superheroes before. That made sense. Now it's a screenshot from a random episode. In fact, he has hair here because this was that gag where the viewer thinks that SpongeBob in a wig, but it turns out to just be somebody who looks like SpongeBob in a wig because the actual SpongeBob in a wig comes by right after this. So this isn't even SpongeBob! It controls fine, the original felt better though. Your standard attack as SpongeBob just floats so well with your movement, and now it feels a lot slower and not as satisfying. A lot of animations still feel unfinished, like they should look smoother than they do. None of the music or voice acting is redone, which is fine, but a bit disappointing. Visually, I think it looks quite nice, but sometimes it just feels like they went for that typical what would Mario or Zelda look like in Unreal Engine fan-made approach. It looks pretty good, albeit unofficial. The boss fights have been severely worsened in my opinion, and they feel lacking compared to the 2003 version. When you were fighting a giant robot in the original, it felt like it. The camera angle made it feel like they were towering over you. Now it feels super lame. And on top of that, glitches are pretty prominent here. Overall, it was really cool to see my childhood game remade from the ground up. Uh, these scenes that are burned into my brain reanimated in HD, it's seriously awesome and warmed my heart. These developers are really talented. I just don't think they had the time or budget to make it as good as they wanted it to be. At the end of the day though, it's fine. It's completely serviceable. I just think the original is still my preferred version and honestly would have favored them just putting the GameCube game on modern platforms and widescreen and call it a day. But at least I have the game portably now. <sighs> the Nintendo Switch version is pretty lackluster. Like, it's all here, but the frame rate is cut in half, and it's so much slower. There's this sluggish feeling to the controls now. Uh, for some reason, the attack button is here on Switch, with the jump button being over here. Why? That makes it a bitch to jump and attack. You have to move your thumb two counties over. Lots of pop-in and distractingly jaggy shadows are all over the place here. It's not ideal. It does the job, I guess, but like, this was on the GameCube. I know this is a much prettier version, but I just think it's a little ridiculous with how mediocre this runs on Switch. Especially considering they just released this game on mobile devices, and it runs perfectly. I don't know. I had my fun with this game, but it has its problems, and I would advise against getting the Switch version, honestly. I need a cigarette. The Outer Worlds was the latest PS4, Xbox One game you wouldn't expect to see come to Switch to come to Switch. They initially wanted to release it in March, but due to melanoma, they delayed it to June and were able to put it on a cartridge. It was originally going to be one of those digital only physical releases. Uh, you know, you get a box, but nothing's in it. I worry about people who buy those. But here it is, The Outer Worlds on Switch.
Not great, but could be a lot worse. Like, they got the game to run, it just can get pretty bad sometimes. Though They have updated it since, and I think it's not too bad on Switch. Uh, perfectly playable, but there are 100% better options. Now, Burnout Paradise Remastered, that was a good port. Of course, it's an Xbox 360 game at its heart, so obviously it would work, but it runs so well, and it's portable full-fledged Burnout, it's great! Namco Museum Archives Volumes 1 and 2 were collections of Namco's NES and Famicom games, so basically the NES versions of Pac-Man and Galaga, that kind of stuff. An interesting collection to do. I mean, these are far from my favorite versions, but I think it's cool when companies bring over these different console variations of games. Uh, give me one good reason why the Game Boy Color version of Grand Theft Auto 2 hasn't been re-released. I think the best thing about Volume 1 specifically is the NES demake of Pac-Man Championship Edition. It plays so well and is so damn fun! Now why they split these across two different volumes, I don't get and I don't like. When these both release on the same day, I find it completely ridiculous to separate them like this. And Ninjala finally released. I didn't play it because I honestly stopped caring. But that didn't stop me from also not giving a shit about the Pokemon Presents presentation this month. So I guess Pokemon now has their own things separate from Pokemon Directs and they just call them Pokemon Presents now? They're the exact same thing, but now the Pokemon Company discovered another page of the dictionary. Here they announced Pokemon Pokemon Cafe Mix for Switch and mobile devices, a free-to-play game that was available a week later. It's a really cute art style, and I don't understand how strategy is involved here. I'm just swirling icons around and hoping for the best, that's about it. You also can't play it in docked mode, only in handheld. Uh, see, Pokemon Company does these mobile games, they just make playable on Switch because f it. But then they announced new Pokemon Snap, revisiting the concept of the original Nintendo 64 game. See, they waited until it made the least amount of sense. You had a whole ass Wii U gamepad that would've worked perfectly for this. I'm honestly pretty happy. This was such a fun idea that for some reason they only did once. I feel like this is a Pokemon game everybody can enjoy, both Pokemon fans and non-fans alike. And finally, the first part of the Pokemon Sword and Shield DLC released after the presentation. It sure did. I picked the monkey when I played Pokemon Shield and got about two hours in. They had another Pokemon Presents a week later and announced a MOBA. I don't know, I played Clubhouse games for 30 hours. A free-to-play game, Pokemon Unite, for Switch and mobile devices. People weren't happy they hyped up another Pokemon presentation and this is all they announced. Thank God Pokemon Cafe Mix launched the same day. The Kingdom Hearts series finally got announced for Switch via a rhythm game. I'm so annoyed I can't be confused on the go. The new Smash Brothers character from ARMS was revealed to be Min Min, a good choice. She seemed to be the best candidate as Springman was already an assist trophy. I don't care that people say, there are no rules that say assist trophies can't get in. I'm pretty set in my way saying assist trophies can't become characters in the same game. Just wait until Senate passes the bill. Only two whole months after reveal, Paper Mario the Origami King released to... Reception. The general consensus on this one is that... It was okay. Not perfect, but definitely a step in the right direction compared to the last two games. Interesting way to say it ruined my lunch. I thought it was okay. It's just very frustrating to see these developers get so close, but never get there each and every time with Modern Paper Mario. Modern Paper Mario has been plagued by poorly thought out battle systems and barely any unique characters. They're limited to using existing ones from your typical New Super Mario Brothers games and not much more. Origami King is kind of better, but not really. So the story here is that the Origami King is transforming everybody into origami. Oh no, why is that a bad thing? Like, wouldn't you want to be 3D instead of flat? Is it hell to be three-dimensional? Is real Mario depressed? You team up with the Origami King's little sister, Olivia, to stop him by traversing a fully connected world, which is pretty cool. Sticker Star and Color Splash had a world map where each location was its own separate level. Uh, here, if you want to go from one place to another, you can just walk there, which does help make this feel more like an adventure. The writing is as top-notch as ever. It was good in color. Splash too, but Origami King isn't afraid to get more serious and have a quiet moment here and there, which I appreciate. The visuals and sound, absolutely wonderful. It's sort of more of the same from Color Splash, but that is far from a bad thing. Exploring these worlds is great, they're so big with seemingly something new to find every step you take. But when you enter a battle with an enemy, you get this ring set up. You have to line your enemies up in a perfect line or square to try to take them out in as few steps as possible. Honestly, lining up enemies is a fun little puzzle and afterwards it's just basic Paper Mario RPG gameplay like the first two games. But the problem is, you don't get any experience points for completing battles. You just get confetti and coins, which you can find anywhere else in the game. And after a while, you start to notice similar formations to line up via the rings. It's like, oh, I've seen this puzzle before, yay. I do like the puzzle aspect. If this was its own game, I think they could have gotten a lot out of this. But after a while, it just feels completely worthless here. What's the point? This has nothing to do with the rest of the game. At least with Sticker Star, you used the stickers to battle. They were the main theme of the game. What the hell does a ring have to do with the Origami King? What does it have to do with Paper Mario?
Mario World, paper in general for that matter. It's not paper themed, it's not origami themed, there's no story reason as to why you have to line enemies up now. What is the point of this? In Color Splash, the battles could also feel pointless, but afterwards you get hammer scraps, which eventually would expand the amount of paint you could hold. It was something. It made the battles feel slightly worth it. In Origami King, you don't get any of that. If I can avoid a battle, I will. Because if you find yourself in one, not only would it feel pointless if it was just battling, but now you have to line up enemies beforehand. This is a cute, fun little gameplay element that they just ruined here. There's no point to it. I liked it for a bit, but then it just got monotonous and you just ask yourself, why am I doing this? And then the boss fights, they're against office supplies. And Paper Mario is so much better now because of it. I'm sorry, this is incredibly lame. If this was the first time they did this, Sure, fine, but it isn't. They used real-world objects for comedic effect in Sticker Star and Color Splash. Here, it just feels like an incredibly lazy way to design original bosses disguised as a joke. Like, if the office supplies were designed as legitimate characters, maybe. But no, this is just a f***ing hole punch. However, when you fight against them, it's not the standard ring format. Instead, now they're in the middle of the ring, and you have to get to it via various arrows and commands you step on. This is completely different from the normal battles. Again, I kind of like the puzzle aspect, but this is basically a different game during the boss fights. And also, this barely matters because at the end of the day, each boss has this very specific weakness you have to figure out, and if you know it, then there's no challenge here. It's just do the thing that this boss is weak against, and you pretty much win. So this whole lead-up puzzle to attacking the boss, to me, it feels like a giant waste of energy, considering many times the boss will regenerate its health if you just keep attacking it after multiple stages of solving its stupid navigation puzzle just because you didn't do the one specific thing you needed to do, which can be somewhat cryptic sometimes. It's just kind of weird that the boss fights are so different from the regular battles. You'd think with a battle system, System like this, they would want to incorporate boss fights that are like the ultimate test of what you've learned by winning in normal fights. That would be at least a slight motive to get into more battles. Now they just went for something completely different. It's obvious after reading interviews with developers that they don't really want to make Paper Mario an RPG anymore. Then stop putting in these f***ing turn-based battles! This game would be so much better if it was just an adventure game where you explored these environments and solved light puzzles to progress. You don't need these stupid-ass battles! Super Paper Mario was basically a platformer with RPG elements. It's not like you need turn-based battles, but no! You keep trying to incorporate them even though you don't want to make an RPG! So don't make an RPG! I don't understand what they're trying to do here. I don't need another Paper Mario like the first two, but those were the two most consistently good. It's easy just to point to them and say, hey, do something like this again, because they didn't have not well thought out bullshit crowding things up. They had unique characters and memorable stories. This one is getting there, but it's still held back by using typical toads. You get a partner named Bobby the bob -omb, and just the fact we got so excited by the fact that this character that looks like any other bob -omb has the most basic name of all time is telling here. We're desperate for actual characters characters in these games. I don't know, I did enjoy a decent amount of Origami King, but about halfway through, it was really starting to drag for me, and I put it down. I do think I kinda enjoyed Color Splash a little more. That game has its own dog shit, but at least the battles felt more worthwhile as annoying as they were, and it never really got boring. I think Origami King's highs are much higher, but its lows are much lower. I still think it's a better overall game, I still think it's okay, but I had a bit more fun with the previous entry. Alright, well, let's talk about something positive. Deadly Premonition 2. This was supposed to be my saving grace. Yeah, the sequel to the cult classic game that polarized critics was exclusive to the Nintendo Switch and released this month. It was riddled with technical problems and generally labeled as not as impactful as its predecessor by Deadly Premonition fans. To everybody else, it was just garbage. Crisis Remastered released, and it's a fine version. It's Crisis, and if you want an FPS on Switch, this suffices. Catherine Full Body came out, just 12 more years until Atlas puts a Persona game on this thing. There was this rumor going around that the Spanish dub of Breath of the Wild 2 was complete, which implied the game was close to releasing. Yeah, and I'm still not sitting. I think around this time, everybody was getting a little antsy for Nintendo news. I mean, we haven't gotten a full-fledged Nintendo Direct yet. Our last one was a mini, and basically all the major games announced or dated in that one had come out at this point. We didn't really know what the rest of Nintendo's schedule looked like after Paper Mario, but thankfully a Nintendo Trios livestream was announced before the Origami King's release. This would show off the game, but also a new title by Way Forward in a franchise they haven't worked with before. Oh my god, what, it might be Metroid or Kid Icarus, maybe Kirby, no, or Wario Land! They, they had to clarify it's a third party franchise, Castlevania, it's gotta be Castlevania, or Bakugan. Yeah, this was stupid. Nintendo hyped up a new game announcement for it to end up being a Bakugan game. 
and a bad one at that. Hey, WayForward can make some excellent stuff, but they still gotta do some licensed kids games to pay the bills. So for every Shantae or DuckTales Remastered or Contra 4 they do, there's a Smurfs 2 right around the corner. Obviously, the publisher of Bakugan paid Nintendo to show this off, but I just think Nintendo needs to be more willing to I don't know, say no to stuff like this? It devalues when Nintendo says they're going to announce a new third party game because chances are becoming increasingly more likely it's gonna be some garbage like this. Well, later on in the month, some high profile leakers said, hey, there will be a Nintendo Direct soon, don't you worry. And on the exact date they leaked, Boom! Nintendo announced the night beforehand that they'll be debuting a new type of Nintendo Direct, a Nintendo Direct Mini Partner Showcase. What wonders await us in- They showed Roll Company! What the hell was this? Much like the Treehouse stream, this felt incredibly tone deaf and basically told us nothing. They showed Cadence of Hyrule DLC and announced a physical release, that's kinda cool. Talked about Roll Company, I really don't care. Showed an entire trailer for WWE 2K Battlegrounds. For the sympathy boat. And then ended things with the announcement of an HD remaster of Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne, and then saying that Shin Megami Tensei 5 is still in development after being announced at the Switch presentation in 2017 and that it will launch in 2021. No gameplay shown, but it's a thought that counts. That was it. It was eight minutes long. That was pointless and shows off a bit of a problem I have with Nintendo presentations lately. It is so much more obvious now when Nintendo just gets paid to show something. Nintendo Directs feel way more commercially than ever before. I mean, they just showed a full ass trailer for WWE Battlegrounds with like no narration by the Direct announcer. Do you really think Nintendo said, you know what our Paper Mario fans would really like to see? That Bakugan shit they're working on over there. I mean, Nintendo presentations are always supposed to be advertisements, but back in the Wii U era or even near the beginning of the Switch one, Satoru Iwata and other company reps made them feel like they were showing up to your living room and just casually telling you what Nintendo's been working on. They made Nintendo employees almost feel like your friends. And now, these are just patronizing commercials that have no idea who the audience for Nintendo Directs and Treehouse streams are. Mies. It's the morning of August 5th, 2020. You wake up with the faint feeling that something is wrong. Picking up your phone, you see the announcement of Pikmin 3 Deluxe. Future generations will never understand what we went through. Announced in the exact same way Paper Mario the Origami King was, Pikmin 3 Deluxe was randomly announced via Nintendo's social media in August. I was just happy to have this get announced so then people could stop wondering when Pikmin 3 was gonna get ported. Here, it's here, right here, and the trailer showed nothing! This trailer is bad. Like when you go to the Pikmin 3 Deluxe website, it said all this new stuff, like an exclusive prologue and epilogue and extra features. Like why wasn't this included in the trailer? Also, this was when the great Nintendo price point debate started to really come into question as many didn't think Pikmin 3 Deluxe was worth $60. And I mean, yeah, this is a seven year old game that on Wii U was $60 at launch and was later reduced to 20, which is the price you could buy it for on the Wii U right now. But at least they were adding some things. But yeah, it would have been way better if they remastered the first two Pikmins and added them in here for a full Pikmin trilogy or something. An indie world occurred, this one featuring games like Hades, A Short Hike, Spirit Fair, Card Shark, it wasn't anything crazy though. But rumors were pointing towards a Nintendo Direct happening after Indie World. See, all these industry insiders constantly run their mouths based on whatever they hear, many getting word that an Indie World presentation was happening, and shortly after, a Nintendo Direct. Listen, you know you're playing with fire saying that. A lot of these rumor guys complain when people get pissed off at them for saying a Direct is gonna happen and it ends up being a Direct Mini Partner Showcase. Oh yeah, that's uncalled for, who cares that much? But at the same time to the people who leak this kind of stuff, what's the point? These announcements will be made regardless of if you leak it or not. If anything, you potentially may force them to not announce it because you leaked it. But you aren't doing anybody a service by leaking when a Nintendo Direct is coming. All you do is set expectations too high and then yell at people for having expectations so high. Well then don't leak Nintendo Direct info. Oh, wow, you get all this fame from telling people what you heard other people tell you. That must feel so gratifying. Now wait right here as I research the history of Wii U rumors and leaks. Another partner showcase occurred. This one featuring Kingdom Hearts, Melody and Memory, the Taiko RPGs, World of Tanks Blitz, Big Rumble Boxing, Creed Champions, which looked bad. The collection of Saga, which had this disgusting border around all the games. Yes! I'm just throwing it out there. This is my year. He ended this partner showcase with a sizzle reel of stuff that wasn't important enough to give full headlines about. What an ending. Yeah, this was a bad start to the whole partner showcase thing, but I got Puyo Puyo Tetris too, and I'm gonna brag about it. Outside of news, this was a sparse month, and I'm not talking about Jump Force. Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Remastered finally came out after being announced two years ago. This is a remaster. And... Jesus Christ. PGA Tour 2K21 and Samurai Jack Battle Through Time. Another rumor came out about a Nintendo Switch Pro releasing in 2021. Dear God, let's move on to September. 
It was not a fun time to be a Nintendo fan when all you have to look forward to is paying $60 for Pikmin 3 Deluxe in October. It's obvious announcements had to be made. Of course, throughout the entire year, many sources were claiming those Mario remasters were coming in, all in celebration of the 35th anniversary of Super Mario Brothers. Nintendo always goes all out for Mario's anniversaries. Remember the 30th anniversary when they shoehorned in Mario Maker as the 30th anniversary celebration and admitted it wasn't really supposed to be, it just kind of all lined up? And the 25th anniversary when they sold us an SNES game on a Wii disc for $30? Nintendo hates Mario and to a greater extent us. Well, we finally got what we wanted. Nintendo announcing games through a Nintendo Direct. On September 3rd, Nintendo uploaded a Super Mario Bros. 35th Anniversary Direct Online that detailed all their plans, including Super Mario 3D World finally coming over to Nintendo Switch via an updated version titled Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. You know, after Nintendo brought over Captain Toad before 3D World and included Mario 3D World as a game style in Mario Maker 2, I like the concept that 3D World will be the only Wii U game Nintendo never ports to Switch for absolutely no reason because Nintendo does stupid f***ing things only they understand every other week. I would have assumed during a developer interview when they would ask, why did you never bring Mario 3D World to Switch? They would say something like, the game doesn't belong on Switch, you had to use the microphone sometimes. It got announced, thankfully, alongside a mysterious edition of Bowser's Fury, Super Mario Bros. 35, a Tetris 99 style version of Mario 1, Mario Kart Live Home Circuit, a game using a real-life RC Mario Kart and a camera to turn your living room into a Mario Kart track. The final major announcement was Super Mario 3D All-Stars, a compilation of the first three 3D Mario platformers releasing in two weeks on September 18th. So, let's discuss. Super Mario 3D All-Stars, one of the quickest reveals to release I've seen for a physical release. I assume Nintendo wanted to go wild with a 35th anniversary at something like E3, but, you know, athlete's foot. So they just announced it at seemingly the last possible minute, and after I saw that announcement in the direct, I went the rest of my life knowing I was disappointed by Mario 3D All-Stars. Those rumors didn't do it any favors. When you say Mario 64 is getting remastered, I'm kinda gonna expect more than this. But disregarding the rumors, let's evaluate this package as a whole. You get three games, Super Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine, and Super Mario Galaxy. Oh no, they didn't include Mario Galaxy 2, Mario 64 DS, Mario 3D Land, why would they do that? I mean, they obviously could have done more here, I assume they kept it to these three because they're all the most distinct of the 3D Marios. You throw Galaxy 2 in there and half the collection is about Mario Galaxy. However, these were the main three that needed to be here, I think we can all agree on that, but oh my god, what budget did this project have? I don't think this menu looks too hot, I get the font choice is trying to replicate Mario All-Stars on the Super Nintendo, but why not go all the way and just have like a nice modern recreation of that menu? Why is the year the biggest text? I like that they include each soundtrack separately to make it seem like there's more stuff in this package. The only bonus feature is the inclusion of each game's soundtrack. Cool. But it's like, who's actually gonna use this? I think it's kind of neat how every time you go to this menu, a different song from one of the games plays, but it would have been nicer to have original music made for this collection. Also, maybe an art gallery, concept art for crying out loud. These are games I would kill to see development history on. Also, quick nitpick. Why does Mario Galaxy show the Wii's white game case, but Sunshine just has the box art, no black game case? On to the titles, and each game has been upgraded in some ways. Mario 64 is still 4x3, which is... Fine. I mean, I personally think widescreen N64 games look weird. But it would have been a nice option considering the other two games in this set are widescreen. It plays incredibly well and looks sharp. They smoothed out a lot of text and used higher quality art assets in some places. But this is still the same exact Mario 64 we all know. Nobody's gonna catch a glimpse of you playing and go, new game, huh? They did use the updated Rumble Pack version of 64, only released in Japan, so it's kinda cool we got that in our neck of the woods for the first time ever. Yeah, Rumble is included, but this version removes some glitches that speedrunners use in Mario 64, so that automatically makes this release an inferior one for many. It would have been nice if they included both the original version of Mario 64 and the Rumble version, but nope. Other than that, it's Mario 64. It's one of the best games of all time, but we've seen it enough at this point. It looks really nice for just being Mario 64, but obviously I would have liked it to be more than just Mario 64. Super Mario Sunshine. This one was upgraded the most of the lot. Full widescreen, and they had to adjust the controls to work with the Joy-Con and Pro Controller. See, the original game used the analog triggers of the GameCube controller, and they had to rework them a bit here since we don't have anything close to to that. It works fine and the game still looks really nice. But they had some cutscenes in Mario Sunshine that they just zoomed in on to fill the widescreen display and I hate when that happens. We're losing out on a good bit of the image. Everything's more clear now, but in the original release I could see more shoes. Then Mario Galaxy, my favorite game of all time. It's a powerful feeling to play it portably. So this is what elected officials feel like. This one was weird considering it used the Wii Remote Nunchuck and the sensor bar. Well now you use the gyroscope for the pointer and it goes off center a lot. It works, but you have to recalibrate it to the center more than I like to admit, and man, that offers even more depth to Mario Galaxy's gameplay formula. Now you have to play the role of a level. They 
also gave you the ability to just hit a button to spin instead of shaking the controller. Though I'd shake the controller anyways because it's damn muscle memory at this point. Playing with the Pro Controller was weird. I can only do two Joy-Con. This feels pretty natural, just like the Wii if the Wii controllers were choking hazards. Now in handheld mode, for all the pointer stuff, you use the touchscreen. What the f is their problem? Why not use the right stick or something to control the pointer? What if you don't want to use the gyroscope at all in Galaxy? Why not offer that as an option? Because they still force you to use the gyroscope pointer to make menu selections in this game. Why? They couldn't have reworked it a little more to make the pause menu option selectable with just the analog stick? That's what makes Mario 3D All-Star so weird to me. It's obviously a pretty low effort project, but they put some effort into this. Enough where I think, if you're gonna put so little effort in, why not put absolutely none in? Why even smooth out the visuals of Mario 64? Why even put Mario Sunshine in widescreen? But they do those things. So at that point, I gotta ask, why not go a little further? Why not make it so you don't have to awkwardly use the gyroscope or touchscreen for Galaxy's menus, or not just straight up crop Sunshine's cutscenes, or put 64 in widescreen, or damn anything more than just adding the soundtracks as a bonus feature? Obviously, I'm incredibly happy these games are on Switch. They're some of my favorites, and it's the first time Sunshine's ever been re-released, and it's not like these are bad versions of the games, far from it. Galaxy is my favorite game of all time. Of course I'm ecstatic to have it here, and looking better than it's officially ever been. I do think it's all worth $60, but you can't just deny the fact that so many other companies have put so much more effort into their collections and charged significantly less. This is Mario. He 100% deserves so much better and it's not like I can just not buy it to tell Nintendo what I think. I'm a bitch! But one of the stupidest things about this is that it's a limited time offer. After March 31st, 2021, this puppy is not going to be manufactured anymore and the digital version's being ripped from the eShop. This is Nintendo creating artificial demand. Everybody ran out to buy this in fear that it would be rare and they couldn't get it in a few months. I mean, I feel so special. I was one of the few 8 million to buy this game. It's not even a special box for the physical release. At least with Mario All-Stars on Wii for the 25th anniversary, this is a classy as hell collector set. Here, I think the inside is just a collage of screenshots. This would take you 30 minutes at most to put together. No booklet or soundtrack CD or keychain or anything. It's a total budget release for $60. Mario 3D All-Stars makes me happy, mad, and lonely. At least WWE 2K Battlegrounds came out this month. Hades was kind of the surprise indie hit here, being nominated for Game of the Year by so many publications, I had to see what the deal was. Am I just bad? Hades is a roguelike, and the main thing I hear everybody say is, I've never played a roguelike, or I hate roguelikes, but Hades is excellent. Yeah. It's a really quality time. Pretty much you want to blast through the game without dying. Each time you die, you just start back from the beginning, but you become wiser and more powerful. But since it's a roguelike, the levels are different now. They're procedurally generated every time, and the combat's really good and satisfying. I'll say it's better than Mario 3D All-Stars because it doesn't force you to use the touchscreen in Galaxy. There was another surprise Nintendo release this month, Kirby Fighters 2. For 20 bones, you get a pretty decently sized Kirby fighting game based on a 3DS eShop game that was based on a mini game in Kirby Triple Deluxe. Basically, imagine Smash Brothers, not as good, but all the different fighters are either Kirby characters or Kirby with different power-ups. That's not too bad, but I unfortunately kind of have the mentality of, yeah, but Smash Brothers is right there. I mean, it's different enough. If anything, Smash Brothers takes a lot from Kirby Superstar in terms of design, so if anybody can make a game like Smash Brothers, it's Kirby. But Kirby Fighters 2 is just alright. You'll get a decent amount out of it, but always go crawling back to Smash Brothers. But that wasn't it for Nintendo this month. Out of nowhere, they announced Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, a successor to Hyrule Warriors, but this time being an official prequel to Breath of the Wild. Again, this was announced like Pikmin 3 and Origami King, just randomly on social media one morning, which does take away a lot from it. Sure, you get that rush, but I do miss the showmanship of the Rex. Oh, joy! Another partner showcase! Well, what the f do you have this time? A brand new Monster Hunter, Monster Hunter Rise, coming exclusively to Nintendo Switch on top of Monster Hunter Stories 2, Fitness Boxing 2, Disgaea 6, and Ori and the Will of the Wisps, available that same day. This is better. I thought Evolution was a myth! Crazy to see Will of the Wisps running so well on Switch as it had some performance problems at launch on Xbox, but hey, it's here, it's lovely, and it shows that Microsoft still considers the Switch to be a legitimate platform for their games. They're allowing so much wiggle room, and that makes me so excited for the future! Some of the future! A Fortnite limited edition Nintendo Switch got announced. The Pokemon DLC was further detailed in the presentation. For the love of f let me talk about Mario 35. Super Mario Bros. 35 is a free battle royale for Nintendo Switch Online members. You play the original Super Mario Bros. through a random string of levels and try to be the last man standing of 35 other players. This is a lovely idea that could be phenomenal, but in the end, 
it's just good. Well, then I'm pissed. For some reason, you have to unlock different levels to vote on for what everybody starts playing, but since most people are only gonna have one one unlock, that's pretty much what you're gonna start on every single game, and 80% of the time when I complete a level, it turns me back at one one or one two. It gets pretty old. Then there's just the potential this concept has. It could be like Mario Maker, where you have different Mario game themes. Imagine a Mario 2 or 3 or World theme. What about completely unique characters like Peach or Toad playable? Also, a problem I have with these Battle Royale games is once I get first place, I kind of lose a lot of motivation to keep playing, and then I beat it. I just think Mario 35 has so much potential, and I want to see it grow and improve. It's super fun, but I'm tired of playing the first two levels constantly, and I can see how this game could be so much more. But as it stands, that probably won't happen, because much like Mario 3D All-Stars, Mario 35 is set to expire on March 31st. After that, it won't be playable anymore. Well, that stinks. At least with 3D All-Stars, there are physical copies out there, so no matter what, you'll be able to find the game and play it. And if you already own it, no worries. Mario 35 is an online game, and when it's gone, it's gone. Nobody can play it ever again. This one I have a harder time understanding. There was definitely more work put into this than 3D All-Stars. It has unique music and a really good online multiplayer system. And to just throw all this work away after a few months of being available, this doesn't seem like a way to heighten the celebration, as Nintendo put it. This seems f***ing stupid. Well, the next part of the 35th anniversary release this month, Mario Kart Live Home Circuit. How does this celebrate that? It just fell into place. You can't tell me Mario Kart Live is supposed to be an anniversary title. A little weird the Switch hasn't gotten any word on having a Mario Kart to call its own. I know people keep pointing to Mario Kart 8 Deluxe selling so unbelievably well. Of course they're not going to make a new one. A uh, game selling really well is why you make a sequel. That Super Mario Brothers is selling so damn well, of course we can't make a second or third or world. Obviously Mario Kart's a little different, where each entry isn't super different enough to release on the same console. Yeah, this is kind of a one game per system franchise. But that gives them an excuse to go hog wild for a new one. Do something weird, do something different. They did what I asked. Mario Kart Live Home Circuit. I would not consider a full-fledged game. It's pretty much a toy with a Nintendo Switch app to go alongside it. For $100, you get an RC Mario Kart with your choice of Mario or Luigi. You connect it to your Switch, and now your living room is a Mario Kart track. But when will it learn to love? This is honestly a super cool feeling. Like, wow. Not only is it fun to see your house from this perspective, but controlling the RC car with your controller and the way it turns and accelerates, it feels like Mario Kart. Not one-to-one, -one, but enough for this to be a really cool experience. For the first hour. This is definitely something I don't need to go back to ever again. I think everybody should try it out at some point, but there's not much meat to it if you, one, don't have a ton of living space, or two, don't have a huge desire to set up elaborate physical courses. Because they have a lot of visual themes for courses here, though the track setup depends on how much you're willing to do in the real world. Most of the music is completely recycled from past games, and playing with multiple people, that's gonna cost you two Mario Kart Live Home Circuit sets at the very least. Really neat idea and novelty, it's just kind of not much more than that. But that's not really at any fault of the developers, it's just a cool little toy and that's all it should really be viewed as. Since it needs Wi-Fi to operate, you don't get a game card with the set, instead you have to download a free app off the eShop. Which means anybody can get in on the fun, even if you don't buy the physical set. Oh yeah, I got Mario Kart Live. Show us the card. Didn't account for that question. Pikmin 3 Deluxe, boy that just kind of released, didn't it? Why did they announce this two months ahead of time? I feel like that kind of made people forget this was even coming out. I mean, like a week afterwards the next-gen systems were releasing. I just don't think this was a great announcement to release strategy for this game. But hey, we finally have a Pikmin game on Switch, and it's still Pikmin 3 and very little else. I adore Pikmin 3. It's one of my favorite Wii U games, and I consider it to be the best of the Pikmin series. One is still my favorite, but looking at each game as a whole critically, 3 is the best, and 3 Deluxe is the best version of it. Uh, the controls on the Wii U version are still a little better because of the Wii Remote and Nunchuck. 3 Deluxe has tons of control options, and I personally prefer using two Joy-Con to replicate a Wii Remote and Nunchuck. The gyro pointer works pretty well, but I had to recalibrate it a ton like with Mario Galaxy. Performance-wise, it's pretty much the same as the Wii U release, sadly. It's still 720p at 30 frames per second, and sometimes that frame rate dips. Come on, I would've loved to see better performance, and the extra features added to this release aren't crazy substantial. I'm happy they're here, but the prologue and epilogue aren't that deep, though two-player co-op in story mode is a super nice addition. I would've liked online play for the bingo battle mode, and maybe reassurance that Pikmin 4 is still coming. We can't have everything, but we can have Pikmin 3 Deluxe for $60. I'd still fully recommend this game. It's wonderful and one of my favorites. The Switch release could have been better, but I still think it's the definitive version. Viva 21 Legacy Edition. 
Who's buying these? EA gave up on FIFA for Switch long ago and just re-releases last year's game with updated rosters, which they did for FIFA 22, so this is not only a reskin of FIFA 20, it's a reskin of a reskin. Big month for news though, a Smash Brothers character was revealed, this one being Steve from Minecraft. It just makes sense. I mean, Minecraft is the best-selling game of all time. Steve is an icon, more so than pretty much any of the other DLC characters. Nintendo announced that the original Fire Emblem for the Famicom was being localized in English for the first time ever as Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light. It would release in December for $6 and be unavailable after March 31st. Nintendo, what is your problem? I mean, that's when their fiscal year ends. They can get more money this way by forcing everybody to panic and buy a Fire Emblem even if they don't want it. But again, this is a digital only game. When it's gone, it's gone. They released a physical collector's edition, but it only came with a download code, which is stupid. What if I get the collector's edition and don't download the game before April? Mm, yeah, that Fire Emblem downloaded. Show us the fucking car! At least they reduced the price of a single Joy-Con down by $10. I don't even see single Joy-Con in stores. Oh look, Nintendo reduced the price of a Dodo Bird. They updated 3D All-Stars with more options for the camera controls. Uh, they care enough about a game that will refuse to exist in a few months. Then we had a few presentations, one Treehouse livestream on Pikmin 3 and Hyrule Warriors, and one final direct mini partner showcase, God Help Us All. Bravely Default 2 gets dated for February. All right, fine looking game and all, and here's just my thing. So many times Nintendo just plays like a five minute long trailer for games like this during directs and I don't know. I feel like you already know if you're interested in Bravely Default 2 the second it got revealed. I don't really think a five minute trailer is gonna change your mind or four minutes into a five minute trailer you go, no, well now I'm interested. Hitman 3 is coming, oh my God, talk about out of left field. It's a cloud version. Talk about out of left field. Jesus, Control is coming too? Cloud version. Uh, today, well, let's see about this. No More Heroes 1 and 2 got ported to Switch, dropping this exact day, and then Nintendo decided to release part-time UFO in a Hyrule Warriors demo on the eShop at the same time. How are these from the same series? They've really improved the partner showcases as time went on. I hope Nintendo realizes that if you're gonna make an eight minute long direct, make sure half of it isn't WWE Battlegrounds. Well, part-time UFO is a cheap little eShop game made by HAL Laboratory, the Kirby devs. One of their latest eShop only non-Kirby ROMs was Box Boy and Box Girl, and I definitely like part-time UFO a whole lot more. This was originally a mobile game but was upgraded for switch and it works really well here i know i said mobile games coming to switch is eh to me well this was done by hal it already feels like a nintendo game it definitely takes more away from the reveal like i already knew this was a thing before but i'm still happy about it you have a set of missions to complete as a ufo with a crane so you want to stack things carefully or meet expectations as well as possible it's really cute and fun and addictive and i want to see more nintendo published eShop stuff like this even if it happened to be an older game for phones no more heroes one and two play pretty well on switch the does anybody else have this weird feeling with the Joy-Con being Wii Remote substitutes where you feel like you have to shake them a lot harder to get some controls to work? Like the Wii Remote would just register smaller movements as a shake. I think because the Joy-Con are more precise, when No More Heroes ask me to flick them up, I literally have to throw them in the air. Control Cloud Version, one of two cloud editions of modern games announced in the same Direct. This is what I fear a lot of games will be on Switch in the future. Just cloud versions because they don't want to go through the trouble of porting it natively to Switch. It runs fine, but like, it's not exciting, it's not ideal, I totally get it. Control and Hitman 3 probably wouldn't have made it to Switch otherwise. This way, at the very least, people who only have the Switch have an opportunity to play them if they're willing to always be connected to the internet. It's just one of those things where you can say controllers on Switch, but I'm gonna squint when you say that. I think most publishers understand the worth of porting their games to the platform. It results in more money. That way you can sell it to everybody, not just people with blazing fast internet and in stores too. If this is the only way these certain games can come to Switch, fine. I just don't want to see it become too much of a trend. Two months have passed. It's about time Age of Calamity released. Can I just say, what a great idea for a game. You already had Hyrule Warriors, which was a fun idea, taking the warrior style and applying it to a giant non-canon Zelda fan fest. Then you have Breath of the Wild, which detailed this giant battle for Hyrule between Link and friends and Calamity Ganon and friends that took place before the game. So, make a sequel to Hyrule Warriors about that. It's perfect. It was a little weird to have a non-canon spinoff get a sequel like this, but I'm not complaining. Age of Calamity is still a warrior's game at the end of the day, fighting off against hordes of enemies. There is some strategy to the combat, but you can still just button mash your way through. Even when you take the game seriously, using all the characters moves and abilities, it can still be fairly repetitive. Like, you just kill all these enemies, go over here, kill all these enemies, go over here. However, unlike the original Hyrule Warriors, this one feels so much more like a Nintendo game. The last game, yeah, and, and Nintendo's input and approval, it's a Nintendo game, but it still felt like it was made by a third party which it was. Age of Calamity feels like it was made by Nintendo. This looks just like Breath of the Wild. They nailed it. It's so much fun to see elements of Breath of the Wild be reworked to be movesets in a Warriors game. It's cool to see what once was a huge open world reconfigured to be 
this. However, while I think it is cool to see these environments in a different context, I do feel like the design was a bit held back by the conventions of Warriors games. Just the fact I can't jump over this small step and I'm this restricted going over here or there, it feels weird with this being an official prequel to Breath of the Wild. It's like that game revolutionized the open world genre, so here's a prequel that feels like a game I'd play on the Xbox 360 in terms of gameplay limitations. But I still had a lot of fun with this. It only got annoyingly repetitive to me near the end. They have you fight the same giant enemies like three times in a row, and there's this one moment where like 20 different powerful enemies were swarming me, I just about blew a gasket. My biggest problem with this game though, is the story. I don't think it's a spoiler considering this is in the first two minutes, but time travel is involved, and right there that automatically devalues a lot of this game's worth. I got this because I wanted to see what Breath of the Wild said happened 100 years prior, instead I get kind of that with some extra really tart sauce. Like, okay, time travel is involved, so this is a variant of what happened. Like, I already know what happened because I played Breath of the Wild, so that's a plus, I guess, considering I had no idea what's gonna happen now, but I wanted to see what I knew happened in front of my eyes. I think Breath of the Wild fans should still give this a shot. It's still a Warriors game at the end of the day, so I don't think it'll make anybody run out and pick up Warriors or Roach 3 Hyper, but it's an awesome supplemental piece to Breath of the Wild, and I had a good time with it. I didn't buy Bakugan Champions of Vestroya, though. I'm sure even the developers are happy about that. Need for Speed Hot Pursuit Remastered. I like that EA is at least kind of supporting the Switch with decade-old driving games. Hey, these are still pretty fun, and it's given the platform some good racing experiences. Weirdly enough, this came out a week after the PS4 and Xbox One versions, even though it leaked on the eShop and was fully playable months beforehand, so it wasn't like it needed extra time. Family Feud. I love Family Feud games. I don't love this Family Feud game. You can't skip any of the cutscenes or dialogue. I don't need this much animation. Just give me the damn surveys. Why is it so hard for developers to make game show games? It should be pretty simple, but they keep f***ing them up. Kingdom Hearts Melody and Memory released at $60. This is coming from somebody who bought Mario Kart Live. Sakuna of Rice and Ruin was a bit of a sleeper hit. It always looked excellent, and those who played it seemed to really enjoy it. There was a supposed leak that Metroid Samus Returns was coming to Switch, as this promotional image for a Switch accessory showed a high-res screenshot from the game running on Switch. This was the last thing an intern ever saw. 3D All-Stars was updated again, this time adding support for the GameCube controller and Sunshine. Why do they care this much? This is amazing, but still, you barely do anything, but barely do nothing at the same time. What were the priorities with this game? A sequel to The World Ends With You was finally announced. Neo The World Ends With You, not Neo, Neo. It was really strange to me how Square Enix kept hinting at a sequel to this game for years. Uh, pretty much right after it released on the DS, they were talking about a sequel and only 13 years later, it finally got announced. There was concern whether Doom Eternal on Switch was canceled or not. Oh my god, that's still not out. Yeah, people's pre-orders were getting axed, but it turned out that was merely due to the fact the physical version was being canceled and Bethesda was simply going for a digital-only release. Well, everybody, let's band together and buy Doom Eternal on Switch to show Bethesda we want more high-quality Switch, but red button! Yes, the Nintendo Switch firmware was updated to include a new icon on the menu, the Nintendo Switch Online Hub. This is pointless, but kind of fun. Look, I get to see the release dates of all the NES and SNES games online, and it even tells me that Natsume Championship Wrestling released close to my birthday. This is at least evidence that Nintendo plans to do far more with Nintendo Switch Online in the future. I assume more pricing plans will become available, like a $30 a year one where you get more retro systems included like Nintendo 64. But in the meantime, this is just a really red wart. Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, the very first Fire Emblem for the Famicom, got an official localization for the first time ever. What else do you want me to say? You know, it seems like this release may have been planned for Wii U. I mean, look how nice and vibrant NES games look like on Switch's online service. Then look at how stupid and dumb NES games look like on Wii U. Now look at Fire Emblem. Definitely a little closer to how NES games look on Wii U, if you ask me. And I'm pretty good at nailing what's a Wii U virtual console game and what's not. This is all I have. It's really cool this finally made its way over, and for only six bucks at that, I really hope other games that were never localized finally make the jump. This was neat, but to be fair, the first Fire Emblem was remade on the DS, so we sort of got an equivalent before. Let's see some Fire Emblem games that never made it over here in any way, or completely different games. Please, God, completely different games. Immortals Phoenix Rising. What's that? It's always nice to see Ubisoft make something that's not totally driven by trends or just what will make them the most money. Immortals seemed like a passion project. Basically, the Ubisoft developers wanted to make their own Breath of the Wild. Well, they did. It's not as good, but it's a high-quality Breath of the Wild type game, if that's your thing. I really don't like the name, though. You could have just called it Immortals or Phoenix Rising, putting them both together. I think most people have no clue what this game is. The original name Gods and Monsters, I think, was a much better title, but you just run into some copyright problems sometimes. At least they're talking to me. Doom Eternal release, digital only. It runs pretty good, but it's a bit too little too late. It doesn't even include the DLC. You'd think they would at least throw us a bone there for waiting so long. And yeah, it's impressive that Eternal runs well at all here, but... I don't know, I think some of the magic of these current-gen games running on Switch is sort of gone. I just end up asking, 
was this really worth it? Was it worth the wait? And honestly, no. I'm so happy it's here. It's just more like, yeah, I guess this is impressive, but I'm just not wowed anymore. Empire of Sin came out. It's about damn time. Everybody remembers this one, right? The game that Nintendo showed at E3 2019 and made everybody go, what was the significance of this game? Why was it a title Nintendo hyped up at E3 and in one of the Nintendo Direct Mini Partner Showcases? Because I didn't see it then, and I sure as hell don't see it now. Collection of Saga, again, why this border? This is so stupid looking. This really only appeals to those who grew up with these titles. They're old school Game Boy RPGs and they're truly a slog to go through. Oh my God, it's the man brave enough to talk shit about Saga 2, Hi-Ho Densetsu. That's right. Double Dragon Neon, the Bit Trip series all came back on Christmas day, which was nice. These are some of the most iconic WiiWare games and Bit Trip Winter is super simple fun, I like it. But of course we can't ignore Fitness Boxing 2, Rhythm and Exercise. Nintendo publishes these games for some reason, but they're pretty good. I really like Ring Fit Adventure, but it is a bit of a hassle to set everything up. In this game, you just use your Joy-Con and punch the air. Ring Fit's higher quality in nearly every way, but fitness boxing is cheaper and easier to jump into and play for just a bit. I don't really see much of a reason to buy this if you have the first, or buy the first if you have the second though. Fuck you, Puyo Puyo Tetris 2! It's so good, it's so good! This is one of my favorite puzzle games. I mean, you get two of the best ones together in one package and they're both firing at all cylinders! Like, this is a full-fledged Tetris game, this is a full-fledged Puyo Puyo one. Story mode is a treat, and there's this new RPG type mode where you have party members and online is a blast and I get my ass kicked by anybody who picks the fucking fish from Puyo Puyo. Cue the music. You can make the argument you don't need this game if you have the first, it's pretty much more of the same with very little improvements. But that's because there wasn't anything to improve, f***er. An Indie World presentation dropping Among Us on the Nintendo Switch that day, plus it showcased Super Meat Boy Forever, which also released in December. It's okay. I really like the original Super Meat Boy, but this was just supposed to be a mobile-only spin-off and they decided to beef it up to be a console game. The level layouts are randomized and it just doesn't work as well as the original. I can commend the idea, like, wow, infinite levels! But it's not as tightly laid out because of it, and after waiting a decade for a new Meat Boy game, this one just comes up short. At the Game Awards, it was announced that a new Smash Brothers character was to be revealed. My money was on Jeff Keighley and it was Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII, more or less the same thing. I feel like they added him because one, he's one of the most iconic villains in gaming, but also two, it actually gave Final Fantasy VII representation in Smash Brothers. For some reason, Square Enix only allowed two songs to be included and no spirit, so to have actual content released alongside Seph, that makes me not pissed. Part of me would prefer they pick a different Square Enix character to just get more diverse series represented, but I'm alright with this. It's time. It finally happened. Hitman 3 cloud version released. Yes! The more I think about it, the less these cloud versions make sense, so it gives Switch owners the opportunity to play these games. But I'm sorry, if you were ever interested in playing Hitman 3 or Control, you probably have a PlayStation or Xbox. And you're gonna need high-speed internet to enjoy these games on Switch. And if you have high-speed internet, I doubt you only have a Nintendo Switch. Scout Pilgrim vs. The World The Game finally came back. The notorious game lost to time due to being digital only on 360 and PS3 after getting delisted. A physical release was announced, it launched on Nintendo Switch, all is well. That was about it for games released in January. Nobody wanted to go face-to-face -face with Hitman 3. But we got a few demos, like for Blonde Wonderworld, a new game by Yuji Naka and Naoto Oshima, creators of Sonic the Hedgehog. It's a Square Enix game, but gives off massive Nights into Dreams and Billy Hatcher vibes. It's dog shit. At least the Nintendo Switch version. Look at this. It's controlled with one button, even in the menus. They all do the same thing. It looks horrible. It doesn't play well. I'm happy they did a demo so people will save money not buying this, but from their perspective, why did they do one? Monster Hunter Rise got a demo as well, and Nintendo revealed a Mario edition of the Nintendo Switch. This looks really sleek, though. It's literally just red. It's not much of a Mario edition. It's just a red Switch, red dock, red Joy-Con with a blue Joy-Con grip. Good color combinations, but if you wanted to make this specifically Mario-themed, you could have added more. More to it. And finally, the Bowser's Fury portion of Mario 3D World on Switch was revealed. Oh my god. Finally, I can play Super Mario 3D World eight years later! 3D World is back in one of the best Wii U ports I think I've ever seen on Switch. It feels like they included and improved every little thing. Something as simple as the Luigi Brothers minigame is still here. The stamps are now fully colorized. The game saving after every level is now in the background rather than right in your face. They even ensured you could still tap and manipulate the environment like you could with the Wii U gamepad. Now you just have to hit the R button and move the cursor around. Every character's walking and running speed has been significantly increased, which makes the game feel 
legitimately fresh if you already played before. Online multiplayer. It could be better, but it could be worse. There's no multiplayer in the Captain Toad levels, which makes a lot more sense. It was always really weird in such a multiplayer oriented game. They just said, F your friends, you've got Captain Toad. It runs at a higher resolution. It's on a console that just flat out makes sense for this game. I almost feel like 3D World makes more sense as a Switch game and Mario Odyssey would have fit the Wii U as the exclusive 3D Mario more. Like 3D World is all about multiplayer. Put it on the system that has two controllers right there. Coupled with the shorter levels, it makes just as much sense as a portable game as it does a console one. Then with Mario Odyssey, I feel like with the map screen you could bring up and a lot of the enemies you could capture, that just feels prime for the Wii U gamepad. At the end of the day though, at least both are now on Switch and 3D World is better than it's ever been. Back on the Wii U, I felt it was a good game, albeit underwhelming as the only 3D Mario on the platform. Now that we have the big open 3D Mario on Switch, uh, 3D World just makes a lot more sense now, and it's way easier to appreciate it for what it is, rather than what it isn't. But that's only half the story here. I think 3D World's Switch release would have been worth 60 alone. They made a ton of improvements to it to make it worth it in my opinion. Nonetheless, we have a bonus experience, Bowser's Fury. It takes the mechanics of 3D World, but puts it in a Mario Odyssey type environment. Fully controllable camera, white open areas, you collect cat shines by completing objectives just like the more open 3D Marios. It's almost like they took a bunch of 3D world type levels, you know, obstacle course type stuff, and spread them around this small open world and it's just really cool. Every so often, Bowser's fury is unleashed. Christ, he's pissed. You always have this fear that Bowser's gonna come out at any minute, and when he does, it makes things a lot more hectic. You either wait it out until he retreats, or you can collect a cat shine to scare him off. But if you collect enough shines, you awaken the Gigabell. I knew this sounded familiar. Then you fight off Fury Bowser as my worst fucking nightmare. This is such a cool, new, and original take on 3D Mario. It combines pretty much everything 3D Mario's been in the past and crafts this lovely smaller game out of it. It's only about three hours or so, but were you really expecting much more? 3D World is the main attraction, though Bowser's Fury is the more interesting to discuss as it gets your mind racing. Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury is an incredible deal. I wholly recommend it. I'd recommend it without Bowser's Fury. With? This game needs to be available to all. Nintendo also published Bravely Default 2. Moving on. I just don't care. I played the demo, it didn't grab me. But people seem to be liking it, and that's all that matters. Whenever a game like this comes out, I am happy because that means Nintendo will move on to talking about other things. Damn it! Before we get to that, Persona 5 finally released on Nintendo Switch. You can tell by the inclusion of the word Strikers. Persona 5 Strikers is a sequel to Persona 5 that is not a turn-based RPG, rather a Warriors-style action RPG. So only three months after Hyrule Warriors, we have another game similar to it, though Persona 5 Strikers does deviate quite a bit from the Warriors formula. Combat's similar, but this feels more like a Persona game than something like Age of Calamity feels like a Zelda one. It's a solid title, though I do find it odd how Atlas thinks that people don't want their core RPGs on Switch. If there's an exclusivity contract between them and Sony, sure, I get it, but it seems less and less likely there is. For some reason, they think regular Persona 5 wouldn't do well on Switch, but its sequel that's a hack and slash RPG, oh yeah, that'll do well. You can think that way, doesn't mean I get it. Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection is a solid return for the Ghosts and Goblins series. I think the art style looks nice, so the animation is a little too Adobe flashy for me. Like, you just see a lot of animation tweens and unnatural looking movements, but I think the actual art looks quite good for the series. And if you want to see where Ghosts and Goblins started, look in your backyard, Capcom spits a series on and everything they can, including the Capcom Arcade Stadium. Uh, these kind of compilations don't really excite me anymore, as Capcom has done a ton of stuff like this in the past. Not only that, but many of the top games in here are available elsewhere on Nintendo Switch, like the Street Fighter Anniversary Collection and Capcom Beat'em Up Bundle. They do this thing where the game download is free, but then you have to pay for pretty much all the games via an in-game purchase, which is Fine. It just, that works for mobile phones. I feel like people would rather have the game just flat out say its price on an actual game platform like this. SNES and NES Online got updated this month. Nintendo, where do you get off? Every now and then we get a good month with some solid titles, but now that these apps are updated like every quarter of the year, we wait and wait and get garbage. I personally feel like Nintendo Switch Online has proven its worth. For 20 bones a year, we get more than enough NES and SNES games, but if they want us to maintain excitement for this service, adding the title screen of Fire and Ice to NES Online alongside the rest of the game's box arts isn't gonna cut it. I'd be down for just flat out original Game Boy games at this point. I think everybody's yearning for Nintendo 64, and I agree. But overall, I just wanna see more legacy Nintendo content come over faster than this and for an affordable price. Damn it! Well, it's time. After nearly a year and a half, we got our first full Nintendo Direct on February 17th. 
You know, I always see people freak out at others for being disappointed in or critical of Nintendo. The same people who scolded others for giving Nintendo a hard time for not doing a full Nintendo Direct since September by saying, what even is a full Direct? You got a Direct Mini, be thankful, were the same people who were overreacting and foaming at the mouth saying, yes, a full Nintendo Direct, Nintendo f my feet! I just get kind of annoyed seeing people freak out about Nintendo announcements acting like this is the greatest pleasure. This is the best sex I've ever had and all I did was watch a Splatoon trailer. Anybody criticizing them is just being nitpicky and how they shouldn't go in having such high expectations. Well then maybe don't hype up Nintendo announcements like they're the 15th coming of Christ. Now with that being said, Chibi Robo 6 is coming! It was good to have these back. Just that feeling of excitement. We were all watching the announcements at the same time rather than waking up at 1pm to Pikmin 3. It was time to be excited for a Nintendo Direct again. So, what did I think? I bought this, you know my opinion doesn't matter. This Direct was all right. No matter what, I don't think Nintendo was going to live up to a year and a half worth of buildup, but I think it was okay, though it had a lot of elements of Nintendo Directs I really don't like. The first announcement was of Pyra and Mithra from Xenoblade Chronicles coming to Smash Brothers. You could have said this was Tweedledee and Bernie from Xenoblade 2, and I would believe you. I don't care. This is fine. I mean, were we really not expecting Xenoblade 2 characters here? If they decided to include the characters from Fire Emblem Warriors, that's when I think everybody should have drawn the line. The Xenoblade franchise only had Shulk as a fighter in Smash Brothers, uh, second or technically third, these characters transform into each other like Sheik and Zelda. That's fine to me. Of course, the typical anime style has been crowding up a lot of the Smash Brothers DLC slots, so it's totally fair to be like, all right, I don't want pointy hair key man, I want the Raisin Bran son, damn it. However, Pyro and Mithra's inclusion doesn't annoy me that much considering Xenoblade only had one rep prior. If they already had like five or six characters and this was the seventh, uh, that's when I'll be like, all right, Stop. Fall Guys is coming to Switch. That was a really popular game over the summer, and then a lot of people stopped talking about it, so it's a good thing it's coming to the Switch in four months. The Famicom Detective games are coming over, which is pretty cool. Uh, these are remakes of these old Famicom visual novels by Nintendo back in the day. I love how companies have just given up trying to localize things for English instead of calling this the Super Sleuth Detective Club or something. And Nintendo of America just said, fuck it, we're just calling it Famicom Detective Club. This is such a neat, obscure part of Nintendo's history that's being fully localized for the first time, and I'm all for it. A Monster Hunter Rise system and Pro Controller and Mario Golf Super Rush. I've been waiting for a game with that subtitle forever. So this looks lovely. It's about time something other than Mario Tennis happened. No More Heroes 3 looks promising, but really low resolution. No idea what's going on here. DC Superhero Girls Teen Power, published by Nintendo. It's fine Nintendo's publishing this, just why is it in a direct? Nintendo made it clear that games like Ring Fit Adventure, Nintendo Labo, their mobile titles, those don't belong in traditional Nintendo directs because they were for a different audience. So why is this here? Miitopia from the 3DS is coming over, sure. That game was fine, it's just like, why? They're putting loads of effort into this too, like it looks excellent now. I think it's awesome to see Nintendo still cares about Miis. It kind of felt like if they didn't have to include Miis in a game on Switch, they wouldn't. Like they were distancing themselves from the brand, but I think Miitopia is a good sign of things to come. Miis are great, they're way better than the stick figures in Clubhouse games. Project Triangle Strategy, right when I thought we were out of the woods. A successor to Octopath Traveler in graphical design only, really. This one is a strategy RPG instead of a turn-based one. Same sentiment I had towards Bravely Default 2 in that Nintendo Direct Mini. Looks good, but do you really need to have a full five minute trailer for this? Anybody who's interested is going to know they're interested within the first minute of this trailer. Nobody's gonna perk their ears up four minutes in. Knockout City, not a bad looking game. Basically an online multiplayer dodgeball game. What killed it in this Direct was the trailer. Nintendo, stop playing full trailers for games. Just have your narrator explain it and move on after a minute. Instead, games like Plants vs. Zombies, Battle for Neighborville, Star Wars Hunters, Knockout City, DC Superhero Girls Team, Power Project Triangle, strategy, they all have these full-blown trailers shown and it's kind of sort of annoying. It doesn't help that their presentation style is kind of weird sometimes. Age of Calamity DLC, here's a two second still frame of everything it comes with and then moving on. What? Ninja Gaiden Master Collection, great to see that. It included as Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge, so that marks one more Wii U game off the list, Devil's Third, your day will come. AJ Anuma appears and says that Breath of the Wild 2 info will come later this year, and to me, this says that game is coming in 2022. If it does, it's pretty crazy. We've waited about as long as we did for the first Breath of the Wild. That game got its first trailer at E3 2014 and came out a little under three years later. Well, Breath of the Wild 2 was first revealed at E3 2019 and we'll probably get it a little under three years later. That's fine, but I think it means my expectations are a lot higher here. Breath of the Wild 1, they had to create this entire thing from scratch. 2 is obviously using a lot of 1 as a base and it's taking just as long to produce. You'd think it would come out quicker, but I'm kind of expecting to be blown away here. In the meantime, we have Skyward Sword HD to hold us over. Yes, Skyward Sword is being remastered for Nintendo Switch. Good for it. 
It looks clearer now, but very little else looks much better. The Wind Waker and Twilight Princess's HD versions felt a lot more dramatically different and improved. I think I've overestimated how much better Wind Waker HD looked in the past. Uh, playing the original, it's obvious they did very little outside of bloom the f out of the game, though it still looks great. Twilight Princess, they did a ton more to the game, but it inherently looks worse because its art style doesn't age as well as Wind Waker's. Skyward Sword being a colorful late Wii game, it does age much better, so there really wasn't a ton they could have done to it, so it's whatever. It just doesn't look dramatically better. It's similar to how Mario Galaxy and 3D All-Stars looked. Uh, comparing it to the original, of course it looks a lot better, it's so much more clear, but if you're just seeing footage of the new version by itself, it's not immediately obvious you're playing the upgrade. They retooled the game to work via standard button control, which is good to preserve this game and make it more readily accessible. The Skyward Sword's emphasis on motion controls definitely didn't sit well with some, so having the option no matter what is a good thing. But the thing is, this game is $60, and that's just a bit ridiculous. Sure, Nintendo knows they can sell the game at that price because we're all stupid and hate savings, but it's just weird they value this game at the exact same price as Breath of the Wild, and Breath of the Wild 2 when that releases, and a remake like Link's Awakening that also shouldn't have been $60, but had a lot more apparent effort put in. And something like Mario 3D All-Stars, where as low effort as that game was, it was three games in one, with one of them being a Wii game as well, with similar levels of changes made. Of course, this being at face value. Skyward Sword HD will probably have more quality of life enhancements, but even with those, this should be $40 max. It's more expensive than it was on Wii at launch 10 years ago, when it was a brand new game! It sounds like I'm really not digging any of this, but I'm not mad, it's just kinda lame to see Nintendo take advantage of the fact they're at the top right now. Instead of pricing things fairly, they think because Zelda's hot right now, now they can price a game like this at 60. And they'd be right. It's a weird situation to be in because the same people complaining about this are the same ones who are gonna buy the game. I think it just stings because I love Nintendo. I want to buy their games and just because they know that they're gonna take advantage of it. It's kinda lame. The final announcement was Splatoon 3. Okay, Splatoon is great, but it feels odd to have more than one entry per system. To me, it feels somewhat redundant to have two Splatoons on the Switch with both being well, Splatoon. 3 seems to be taking things in a post-apocalyptic direction, which seems cool, but at its core, it looks like more Splatoon, which is fine. It's just I'm not crazy excited considering I can already play Splatoon on the Switch right now. Of course, I just said how Mario Kart needs a new entry, but that's because Splatoon 2 was a new game. It had a whole single-player expansion. I don't really think the Switch was desperate for more Splatoon. Mario Kart 8 came out in 2014, and we've been nursing on those tracks ever since. A cool announcement, but with Splatoon 2 readily available, it's hard for me to get that pumped up. At least the single-player seems to be more open adventure style. With Splatoon feeling the need to make their world feel as lived in as possible, it was always odd to me the single player stages were simple obstacle course designs. I felt like an exploration styled story mode would work well for the series, and we might just get that with three. That was alright. At least we had a Pokemon Presents later on, showcasing remakes of Diamond and Pearl, Brilliant Diamond, and Shining Pearl. They look very simple and aren't developed by Game Freak, surprisingly. I wish they would have gotten Crezzo. They did the Link's Awakening remake and are working on Miitopia for the Switch. I just feel like while this style is cute, it could use some better detail and lighting effects, like with Link's Awakening. But while Game Freak isn't working on these remakes, they are working on Pokemon Legends Arceus, an open world take on Pokemon. It's cool to see them try something legitimately new and interesting. It's terrifying to see this frame rate. And that was the Nintendo Switch's fourth year. A lot of people seem to really hate the lineup this time around. Uh, considering the circumstances, I personally thought it was alright. I think what's the most concerning is the near future. Uh, 2021's lineup looks pretty bad. It's pretty much entirely re-releases outside of Mario Golf. And the bigger games Nintendo's hyping up right now are sequels to games we already have on the Switch, which is great but it does feel a little been there, done that compared to how these games felt when they first appeared on the Switch. I mean, we're officially in the five year mark of this system. That's crazy to think, but that's generally the expected lifetime of most platforms. It's not gonna be the end of the Switch, but most consoles, half a five year lifespan. If the Switch is gonna continue past that mark, I think a small revision at the very least is needed. I wanna be excited by the Switch again, but at the moment, the hardware is just starting to show its age and it's not as magical as it once was in 2017 and 2018. And plus, Nintendo's getting a bit too egotistical. They've always done whatever they felt like doing, but at least during the Wii U era and the beginning of this one, they felt a lot more humble. Uh, now, they'll charge 60 for anything with a leg on the cover. Just some concerns for the future, but Nintendo is still working harder than a lot of other game companies. They put out more games than both of their competitors, even at their worst. At their worst.